We're recording. Okay, so it's just one minute past the hour, so I think we're ready to start this webinar. Hi everyone, this is Nancy Shin, and today is April 29, 2020. I am the Research and Data Coordinator for NNLM's Pacific Northwest Region, and I'm your host for today's session. Today's class is brought to you by NNLM's PNAR Rendezvous. Our topic this month is citizen science. More specifically, what's all this talk about citizen science? Before I introduce today's citizen science speakers, let's take care of some housekeeping things. Today's webinar session is being recorded and we have closed captioning today. So I thank our closed captioner for being with us today. The links to the evaluation will be provided at the end of the class. For those that want MLACE, the evaluation will have a code for you to use to get your MLACE once you've filled out the evaluation. The recordings will be posted and sent to all who registered within about two weeks or so, and they will also be on the NNNLM YouTube channel. So for the sake of, of the speakers, you are all automatically muted, but any questions that you have, you can type in the chat box. The presenters will stop at certain points in the presentation to review your questions. So without further ado, let's meet our webinar speakers. Today, we are very, very lucky to have three amazing people lead us through today's talk on citizen science. First, we have Darlene Cavalier, who is a professor of practice at Arizona State University School for the Future of Innovation in Society. Darlene is also the founder of SciStarter, which is a popular citizen science portal and research platform connecting millions of people to real science that they can do. Next, we have Cheryl Rice, who is currently in her 17th year of teaching high school. Cheryl teaches science at the Dow High School in Oregon State. Last but not least, we have Pete Rexick, who also teaches high school science at the Dow High School. Now, let me hand it over to Darlene to lead the discussion on citizen science. I'm just going to pass the ball over to Darlene. I am now the presenter. Okay. Good afternoon. This is Darlene Cavalier, dialing in, I guess, from or patching in, zooming in, WebExing in from um, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I'm a professor at professor of practice at Arizona State University and the founder of SciStarter, which is a platform that helps connect people to citizen science projects. So. We'll talk through what citizen science is, who can be a citizen scientist, um, how to get started, and how to continue your journey once you get started. I'm just going to go back to this one slide real quick. Citizen Science Month is right now. We have one more day left in Citizen Science Month. It's April. It's been a very, very busy month. We've done a lot of work in support of libraries in particular to help libraries become community hubs for citizen science. Um, we're very grateful to the National Library of Medicine and the National Network of Libraries of Medicine for their support in making Citizen Science Month possible. Okay, Nancy, I may need your help with this live poll here. Um, opening that poll. Oh, yeah. This is just a fun way to find out who's tuning in Gotta take the ball from you for a second. Sure. Okay, there it is. <clears throat> okay. So um, if you can still hear me, answer you can select one of these options. Are you a citizen scientist in the making? What we should have added here is maybe you're already a citizen scientist. Are you a, a parent of a potential citizen scientist, a teacher, educator, facilitator, basically, a librarian, just a bored person on the internet, or none of these? We'll just take a couple of seconds. Three, two, one. All right, Nancy, let's close that poll. Do we get to see the results? <clears throat> yes, Maddie, would you do the honors?
No worries, we can't now. We can always come back to this. WebEx um, does this thing where it does a 20 second countdown and I couldn't unmute myself while it was doing that. <laughs> the poll results should be showing right now. Okay. Oh wait, now they're showing. Oh, lots of librarians out there. No bored people on the internet. Hmm. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm surprised. <laughs> So um, let's see, I may need the, do I have the ball again so I can advance it? Yeah, passing that okay. on. So now we ask, what is citizen science? It's typically a collaboration between professional scientists and anybody else. Anybody who's curious or concerned, which everybody is at some point in their life. The thing that distinguishes um, citizen science from other types of STEM outreach projects, you know, science, technology, engineering, and math. Um, isn't just that people are motivated to make a difference when they're involved in these projects, it's that they're actually advancing areas of research. So when I said typically it involves a professional scientist, at some point a professional scientist is involved, um, almost always. But many times a project may start because of a community concern. Communities may be concerned about um, loss of biodiversity near them or um, a suspicion that they have poor air quality. So they can um, get involved in a, an existing citizen science project to learn about the protocols, understand what, if any, specialized tools or instruments might be used so that when they do collect data and share their observations about issues, their data can be considered credible. And that's how change happens. They trust, they trust the data coming in from the citizen scientists and change can happen that way. Oh boy. All right, another live poll. Sorry, and I, I think this is the only, this is the last live poll. But I'm curious to know if anybody has already participated in a citizen science project before. Let's see. Okay, polls open. Thanks, Maddie. People are responding very quickly. Great. And we'll give it five, four, three, two, one. Okay. I'm closing the poll now, not muting myself this time. <laughs> and WebEx is giving you uh, stragglers a 15 okay. second countdown to uh, submit your answers. So hit the submit button if you haven't finished yet. A few more seconds. Okay, the results should be on display now. And I'll pass the ball back to you, Darlene. Oh, no. All right. This is this is good. I, I like this because um, well, it's a nice mix, let's say that. Um, and maybe later on, if we have some time in, in chat, we can get a sense of which citizen science projects people have participated in. But um, it's nice that most of you have not yet. So this is a, a book that you may or may not have in your library. If not, I encourage you to bring it to your library. It's called The Field Guide to Citizen Science. And I am very biased because I co-authored the book. It just came out um, a month or two ago, and this is really designed to help introduce people to citizen science. Um, it features 50 different projects with step-by-step -step instructions, and the book is divided into, um, into chapters that make it easy for somebody to identify immediately with the type of project they may wanna do. So there's a chapter for educators, there's a chapter um, or a section for understanding how to find citizen science resources at your local library. Um, and then there's ones for um, senior citizens, um, people who just want to do projects at home, which is super uh, timely right now. So the Field Guide to Citizen Science is, is available digitally or, or in print. Um, I also want to encourage our, library, our librarians and staff on the line here to Think about um, working with SciStarter and Arizona State University. Um, we've done a, probably 100 different online events this month in uh, Citizen Science Month um, with libraries um, to help libraries um, pa patrons remember that they can still access digital resources from their library. Their library still plays a very relevant role in their community. Um, and we can also help by doing something just like I'm doing now introducing your communities to citizen science 
and even getting them involved in a project from home, online, in real time during a, a web event. And this is, this is a free service that we offer and we'd be thrilled to help you if your library is interested in something like that. Your, your part of that equation would be to just make sure that your patrons know that it's happening. Let us know what type of resources from your library that you want to promote. Um, and you know, join us to help answer some questions that may come up in chat. Just another pretty picture of the book. So as I mentioned, it's Citizen Science Month. It has been an incredible month. Um, so many different projects and events and uh, mostly turned online. Uh, but it's been so exciting to see the enthusiasm build for citizen science around the world. So citizen science is a global effort, even if projects can be done locally. So we'll go through a couple of examples soon. But I think it is really important to remember that your contributions advance areas of research, and that research matters at a local level more often than not. Change our logo to be at home. This is um, kind of the money shot of a, if there is a web page to go to and to remember from my presentation, it's this one. SciStarter has, oh, something like 3,000 projects. So typically, a scientist or a project leader will register their project on SciStarter and tell us all about it, and that helps us match people to the best type of project. But it can be kind of a little difficult finding the right project when you're sifting through 3,000 projects. So in collaboration with um, the National Library of Medicine, we curated a page and we selected six, I think we may have eight on there now, but we selected six projects that help advance human and environmental health research. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about those projects. One project is called Crowd the Tap. This definitely is a project that gets done at home. Um, and there are library kits for Crowd the Tap. Um, but this project you can also do without any instruments. Those kits are really just designed to help promote the project and just make it very easy to have everything in one place for somebody to get involved. But using a simple penny and a magnet, um, you're asked to help build the first of its kind inventory of drinking water pipes. So before we can test to see if lead is in water, it's really helpful to know where lead pipes might exist. And also maybe as a reminder that even if you don't have lead pipes, you may have PVC or plastic pipes, those come with their own risks too. So this is as a first step to help people understand what types of pipes are carrying water into their house that they're drinking. So you do a little scratch testing, use a little magnet to help with that project. And then you enter the data. This is one of the projects that you actually enter your data through SciStarter. Typically, projects are not hosted on SciStarter. Just information about them is hosted on SciStarter. So it will become more, more or less a, a clearinghouse in that regard. Hundreds of those projects use tools that report back to SciStarter how frequently people are contributing to their projects. So what that means is we can measure collective impact among people who have SciStarter accounts, even if they're doing projects on other websites and apps. And from a privacy standpoint, they opt in for that type of tracking. Um, and usually they'll do that because their teacher assigned a project and they need to show some evidence of that. And it's nice in their SciStarter dashboard to be able to show all the different projects they did and how many times they contributed to that project. So this is Crowd the Tap. Stall catchers, I bet some of you have done stall catchers. This was a featured project last year during Citizen Science Day. And we say it was so good, we couldn't keep it in one day. We had to spread it out to a whole month. But what stall catchers is about, it's an online project and it's gamified. So it's, it's actually a fun type of project to do. And um, what you would do as a citizen scientist here is look at very short video clips. I mean, like a couple seconds long. And it's black and white ultrasound videos showing blood moving through the vessel of a mouse brain. And that mouse was infected with Alzheimer's. This is a research project out of Cornell University. And the reason why your activity matters is because you're helping to identify how many stalled blood vessels are in that mouse brain. And so the little video clip will show you either blood that's moving, they call it flowing, or blood that's stalled. 
And so you're asked to click blowing or click a button that says stall. 10 people have to see the same thing on that same video clip in order for that to become credible data, research grade data. And connecting this to Alzheimer's is because there are experimental drugs that are being tested and that have already shown evidence that when the stalls are removed from that mouse brain, memory is re um, returned, restored in that mouse brain. So it's a really exciting project. They have a lot of data that needs to be analyzed. And like I said, they made it fun and engaging. It's a great intergenerational project too. You know, for all the, all the um, grandparents who are, who are stuck at home, it's a really neat way to connect online um, because your library can create a team and you can engage all your patrons to get involved in that project. Families can create teams. I highly recommend all the projects, but certainly stall catchers. Flew near you. And this project has quickly pivoted to have a sister project called COVID near you. This is a project from Children's Hospital in Boston and Harvard. And what they, they do is they ask you to just report the symptoms of how you're feeling. It's a very, very simple survey, basically. And you just report if you, how you're feeling. And even if you're feeling great, you might say, I'm, I'm feeling great today, so that's good. And what this was originally intended for was to help predict flu outbreaks. And so you can imagine why that's super important right now to help predict, find and predict COVID outbreaks too. So this is flu near you. And again, these six projects are the featured projects on SciStarter.org forward slash NLM. I see change. This is an app based project, mostly based on an app, um, a free app that you download. And when you see things that seem unusual outside, even if you're stuck inside and you're looking out your window, you may see some unusual things. Um, you know, I've seen a dragonfly swarm, which was I was super curious about. I see change is a great place to say, hey, I, I'm taking a picture, I'm uploading it to this app, and you can say if this is normal or is this something different that you haven't seen before. And then I see change uses this information that's generated by citizen scientists reporting things that they're seeing in nature and weather, and they map it to um, satellite data. And so they also start to look at changes in climate and they have evidence that is um, very, very useful because when you have community members that are telling their story and, and their own story is the evidence that something may be changing or something is different, um, it turns out that's super valuable um, and it helps create um, data where gaps exist. Globe at night. Um, very popular project in Arizona where, um, you know, stargazing is, is a big, big hobby out there. And for some people, it's more than a hobby, it's more than a passion, it's a job. So um, Globe at Night enables people to basically look at the skies, spot and look for specific um, constellations, and you're, you're guided through this whole process. So for somebody who is able to check out a Globe at Night kit from a library, and again, it does not require, you don't have to have some instrumentation for this. We have kits available in libraries in, in Arizona. Um, so everything is together in one place and somebody has a printout of constellations and printout of the instructions and so forth. But the project walks you through it anyway. So this is pretty fascinating that when you have to um, identify the stars that you cannot see, that's actually a measurement of light pollution. It tells us something. If you can't see it, um, it's probably a byproduct of light pollution, which is basically artificial light that's getting in the way of you viewing the um, Milky Way. And so um, the other reason it's important is because light pollution affects human health, environmental health, and, and animals too. They, they breed differently, they nest differently, they migrate differently, people can't sleep. So uh, a measurement of what's happening with light pollution is, is really important. And this scientist too, Connie Walker, has reported that uh, people are able to see more stars this past month, which makes sense. Not as many um, you know, companies are open with huge lights on their sky rises and so forth. So this is a really interesting project to get involved in, especially now. 
and then to measure that over time. It's a global project you can do locally. So um, this is a, a look at some of the kits that we have in libraries. And any library is welcome to access these. Um, anybody can access them. Actually, we have a way for you to build or borrow or buy them. So the, the build component just gives you the instructions for what we did to create the kit and links to where we bought different supplies for it. The borrow tells you which library near you. Now, you know, with these kits that you're looking at on, sc on screen here are in Arizona right now. We hope to extend it nationally. But right now they're in Arizona. Um, they're also in um, Los Angeles and St. Louis. Um, so the kits here, you can go to scistarter.org forward slash library to see the different kits and the related projects. Um, and then I'm going to show you a new, another resource that is specifically for librarians. On that library page that I just showed you um, is a module that we encourage you to use. And if you do want to work with us and collaborate on some online events um, where we can introduce citizen science to, to you again, to your staff, to your patrons, what we would do is run through this tutorial that you see on screen here. Um, this was designed by the instructional designers at Arizona State University with support from the National Library of Medicine. It was written for a fifth grade reading level, um, but it's great for adults and people of, people of all ages. Um, we love it too because it deliberately um, is attentive to making sure that people of color and underrepresented and underserved communities um, are represented in the tutorial. And so what, what it is, is a self-guided online tutorial. And so you learn what citizen science is, who can do it, which is everybody, how to join, and some reasons for participation. And at the end, um, the participants can get a certificate. Um, and then we, it takes about 30 minutes to go through the tutorial, watch the videos, and actually do a project together. So again, I just want to highly recommend this is all free. Um, if you embed this on your library's website, if you host an event and walk people through it, these are ready-made materials for you. Um, you'll find a lot of this on this page, scistarter.org forward slash library hyphen resources. This is where you'll find step-by-step -step instructions to make the kits or access the kits, information on grants that are available, to libraries to bring the kits to your libraries and the programs um, related to them. Um, follow on activities, ideas for connecting citizen science to um, amateur astronomers, gardeners, senior citizens, Girl Scouts, educators, homeschoolers, um, just a chuck full of information on the library hyphen resources page. There you will also find the library and community guide to citizen science. This is, although it's in PDF form, this is something that's constantly updated with new information as we, SciStarter and ASU, learn, um, learn more about working with libraries and get ideas from librarians about what can make citizen science better for them as employees or volunteers, as well as the, the patrons or customers they serve, we update this guide. So in there, you'll find uh, what we think may be best practices for bringing citizen science to your library and or supporting existing communities of citizen science, like the Girl Scouts. They do a full journey through SciStarter called Think Like a Citizen Scientist Journey. And that's awesome. It's a great project, and we love working with them. But it did dawn on us that there's an overlap between the projects that they're doing for their journey and the take action that results from that. and kits that we have available in libraries. So we're now just starting to encourage Girl Scouts to think about when the libraries reopen, think about the libraries as a safe, open, accessible meeting place. Not necessarily just to have their, you know, their, their troop meeting, but to share what they've learned with patrons, to check out the kit, um, and then also to be ambassadors and facilitators of teaching other people what citizen science is and how they can get involved. Your library can also use some free tools from SciStarter. One is an embeddable project finder that looks a lot like this, but you can put your brand on it. It just helps you um, kind of make it easy for people to find 
projects that you can filter already. So you may look for, um, you, you may use this tool and say, you know, I really just want projects that are either global and can be done anywhere or online, or projects that can be done in, let's say, Arizona. And that's all that will be pulled from the database onto your, onto your website. But as you can see, you can search for projects using the advanced search button. You can search by age group. You can look for projects that have classroom materials, by topic, by activity. Activity is a fun one. Activity is show me something I can do while I'm at the beach. Show me what I can do while I'm fishing, what I can do while I'm hiking. And it breaks it out to make these um, less cumbersome for people and more enjoyable. This is the event finder. Oddly, the projects are in a separate database from the event. Um, and that's, there's a whole, I won't bore you with all the details. But the event finder is another thing to consider that if you end up wanting to do an online event with us, um, we would invite you to add it to the event finder. And it helps lots and lots of people find out about your event, register for the event, and we are not um, territorial at all. We don't need to own the event. Our job at SciStarter and ASU is to support libraries. So we have lots of great assets that we want you to use. Um, we have a nice megaphone. We have you know, millions of people that use SciStarter, um, a very strong cohort of close to 80,000 people that are registered users that we can call upon to get involved in events. Um, and as you do local events and your libraries open up again, it's not at all difficult for us to message existing citizen science people in your area and let them know about events that you have going on. So we hope that what happens is by you supporting citizen science and bringing it to your library, you also may, um, uh, I guess, attract new patrons to come in. Those new patrons will be existing citizen scientists that are out there. And this is an important page too. This is nnlm.gov forward slash national forward slash guide forward slash CCS, which I'm taking is uh, crowdsourcing and citizen science there. You'll find more information, um, some of the links that I talked about today, information about the kit and the, um, and the, uh, the guide that we put together too. And I think Nancy said she's also going to follow up with all of the different links that I referenced here. Thank you very much. Just know there's something for everyone. Citizen science advances important areas of research. Um, we've gotten feedback about the amount of data coming in from Phoenix as a result of the kits that have been checked out. That feedback is coming from the scientists. So the citizen scientists there are just doing a fantastic job. And I hope everybody's doing well and that you're all hanging in there. And we're here, like I said, to support you. And thank you for having me. <clears throat> thanks, thanks, Darlene, for that. Um, it's now question time. I've collected some questions from part one of the presentation. The first question asks, um, Darlene, do you have sample social media messages or images to promote citizen science on library social media? Yes, yes, we have we have um, a, a good folder, and is the best way to send that to you, um, Nancy, to send out to everybody after the call. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so we have it for Citizen Science Month. We have it for projects, and we definitely have it for um, libraries too. Okay, awesome. Thanks, Darlene. The another question asks this. Um, so these are all kits that can be printed out and distributed. Nothing else is needed is a question. No. Um, for the kits that I showed on the SciStarter.org forward slash library page and the library resources page, those are physical kits that, um, that a patron checks out from the library. There's printed materials in there, and so we have the templates that you can just print out and use. But they also have some, some tool or some equipment that's not easily found around the house. That's why we put those particular kits together. For example, Globe at Night. You don't have to have a dark sky meter to get involved in Globe at Night. You can do the project without those instruments for sure. But the dark sky meter builds some confidence because it actually measures the, the light. 
Um, in that kit, we also include a little infrared, um, uh, I'm sorry, an LED light, just so it's like safe when you're walking to the place to do some stargazing without interfering with other people's stargazing. Those things are not required for the project. It just makes the experience better. So each of those kits has some physical item in there as well. Okay, and there's another question about kits as well. Um, this question asks, are the kits in libraries only in Arizona libraries? Well, right now they are only in Arizona because that, that was the scope of work for the project that made that possible. So that, that um, scope of work was supported by um, the Institutes for Museum and Library Services to work specifically in Phoenix and then we spent, extended it, sorry, to Arizona. But everything we do because we publish it and make it open, um, we're curious and we're trying to keep our eye on the pulse or keep our finger on the pulse of what's happening out there to see if other libraries are modifying the kits and using them. And we do actually see that. We see evidence of that in Los Angeles. We see evidence of that in St. Louis. And we suspect elsewhere across the country. What we are, what we have our fingers crossed for is, um, is uh, the next round of support from IMLS, which probably like other people on the line, we'll find out in, in June or July. Um, if we get that support, we will be able to rather quickly scale this nationally and provide support to libraries to bring these kits in and teach them how to modify them and make them um, you know, more accessible to their, to their patrons. Okay, and we have one last question, and again, it's about kits. Um, are the kits of materials or background information? The photo made it look like they were just attractive flyers in a display. Okay, that's a good question. Yeah, I should put pictures of the actual kits. When you go to scistarter.org forward slash library, you'll actually see pictures of the kits. So each one of the um, cards that you see there that says like, hey, this is about monitoring air quality, or this is about water quality. When you click on those cards, one of the images you'll see in the next window will be the actual picture of the kit and the physical contents of the kit. And so um, everything is laid out in terms of what, the, um, what all the materials are that are in the components of the kit on that library hyphen resources page. So they're physical things. It could be, for one of the projects, it's, it's an actual Android phone, it's an air quality sensor, it's a checklist. So everything you need for a project is in the physical kit. But I just want to remind you that in case you don't have an opportunity to, to um, incorporate the kits in your library, if you do, that's awesome. And I really hope that you connect with me so that we can walk you through the steps and just kind of make it easier for you. But if you don't, um, a wonderful way to introduce citizen science or through some of these other digital tools, um, like the introduction to citizen science tutorial, um, and then some of the free things that we offer through SciStarter too. And of course the books, you know, even just having a book display up to celebrate citizen science, there are a number of books, not just mine, that are about citizen science, as well as books that can enhance skills that are often required for citizen science, like how to take a good picture or how to make a good measurement and so forth. <clears throat> okay, awesome. Thanks, Darlene, for answering those questions. I don't see any more questions in um, the chat box right now. Um, so I'm going to now hand it over to um, Cheryl Rice, who's going to talk to us about her citizen science experience as a high school teacher. Great. I'm going to pass the ball over to Cheryl Rice now. Great. Thanks, Nancy. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Cheryl Rice. And uh, as uh, basically what I did was uh, I worked with the Marine Debris Tracker. And just to give you a little bit of background information, first of all, I want to thank Michelle from the National Network of Libraries here in the Pacific Northwest for introducing SciStarter to us because we never even heard of it. And it just happened to be through a friend, a colleague that knew Michelle that she got back to us and we, here we are doing a, a webinar, so which is great. Uh, so one of the reasons um, 
reasons why I chose Marine Debris Tracker was I went to the SciStarter website and I looked through all the different types of projects that were available. And I had certain types of criteria for my particular project. I'm at the high school level and I teach environmental science. So I wanted the project to be a part uh, that I could easily put into my environmental science curriculum. So that was one of my first criteria. My second criteria was I wanted it to be able to complete it during class time. And that means that it had to have been easily accessible and also doable. Um, and as I was going through all the, <clears throat> excuse me, as I was going through all the projects, I decided that Marine Debris Tracker fit all those criteria and it was a perfect, perfect fit. So originally my imp implementation was to take my environmental science class out a couple of times, uh, once before spring break and after spring break. But there's this slight change of plans uh, since we switched to distance learning um, right in the middle of March here in Oregon. So instead what I did was um, I created a lab to go along with the mar marine debris tracker and basically the students use the Marine Debris Tracker app to collect data. And let me show you some information on the Marine Debris Tracker app and show you how it works. So this little turtle thing, a uh, little turtle picture, is basically um, you download it onto your phone. And I, you go to the App Store. I have an iPhone, so I just went to my App Store and downloaded uh, or searched Marine Debris Tracker app, and it was a free download. Uh, and now I have this little turtle button on my uh, my phone, which is fantastic. So <clears throat> what uh, you can see on the picture on the left hand side where it just says Marine Debris Tracker, that's the first page that when you click on your little turtle on your phone, that's the first page that um, opens up. And the easiest thing, it's, it's such a super simple app that all you have to do is you can just start tracking and you can actually uh, input your data into multiple organizations, which I thought was really cool. So I had my students add their data to the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, uh, their marine debris list. And once, basically what happened then was the students collected, I asked the students to collect data for 30 minutes, and they just walked around their neighborhoods looking for trash. And we are not directly on, uh, on the ocean or at the beach or on the shore, but we have a, a massive river, the Columbia River, that's in our backyard. And that obviously leads to the Pacific Ocean. So no matter what, we are not directly connected to the Pacific Ocean, but we are indirectly connected. And I wanted to show my students this, especially since we just finished talking about water use and water pollution in our, in our um, environmental science class. So the picture on the right-hand side uh, where it says items collected and then it gives you a bunch of different sections. Well, once the students were walking around and found a piece of trash, they clicked on the uh, sections, uh, you know, the plastic, the metal, the glass, or, and all the other examples depending upon what they found and which then brought them to um, the different types of trash. For example, you could see where the plastic, it gives you food wrappers and beverage bottles and then other containers. And it, plastic has probably about 30 different types of things that you can enter in. Um, all they had to do was click how many that they found of that particular item, click add, and in the upper left-hand box of that screen, um, you see a little trash can and that's where it was added into. So super simple way to collect and store data. And with the, the number of items in the trash can obviously increased when the students added the trash. Once they added the trash, uh, the, another cool thing that the app did was they, the app determined the coordinates and tagged it on a map. This is not, this was just a, a picture that I got off the internet. It was not from mine, but, uh, um, but it's connected and it, it sends that information back to the scientists that are doing um, the data collection. So for my class, we actually uh, collected a total of 315 pieces of trash and I asked them to pick them up, not just to leave the trash there, but obviously to pick it up as well. Uh, and uh, the top, the top um, piece of the trash that we collected were, were obviously paper and plastic. So um, what went really well in this 
in this online distance learning was the app is super simple and easy to use. And the other thing that went well was um, I didn't have to make a video to show the app, to show the students how to make the app because there was another teacher who jumped on the gun before me. I just had to look it up and bam, it was there. And uh, I just posted her video and she showed it directly, e really easily, easily to show how to use the app. Um, what would I do differently with the Marine Debris Tracker? Uh, unfortunately, I can't control this, but I would have loved to be in school to do this. And uh, obviously, the powers that be didn't make that happen, but that's okay. Uh, but I would also have done, had students do this multiple times, like maybe go out once every month or um, once every two months just to see how much trash is, are in these areas, maybe with the same path or different paths and collect that data. I think citizens, the benefits of citizen science are extremely important uh, because it's getting everyday people involved with cool, really cool research opportunities and contributing to science. So uh, what I also did after my students uh, finished the lab was I posted, there was a recent Science Friday podcast on citizen science that also provided much uh, more information about citizen science and then also more details about other projects. And I had my students discuss what their thoughts were on the benefits. And um, basically what they said was, the scientists can collect data on a larger scale, and they also uh, helped lead, excuse me, lead uh, to greater scientific discoveries, which I think is fantastic. Uh, I also asked the students what other projects that they would be interested in, in and uh, there was a bunch of other ones that um, Darlene has mentioned that they were interested in just from looking at the citizen science website. So my advice to teachers and uh, you know librarians out there is just get the word out and exposing us to this. I didn't know about this until uh, you know a colleague who knew someone who you know knew about this information, and I thought that was super important. Is just about your connections. Um, and the, another cool thing is is I'm actually doing this with my own kids now. We've downloaded a couple of other apps that we're trying during these crazy times, and we are enjoying ourselves and having some fun out there. So that's all that I have. If you guys have any questions, I'm, I'm here. <clears throat> yes, it is question time now. Uh, some, collection, some questions that I've collected for part two of this presentation include this one. Um, this person asks, notice an increase in promoting the value of data for community activism. Are you getting a positive a positive response on that? Yes, uh, I, you know, I think be, making the students aware that this is out there, that's something that they could do, even if they're not uh, interested in doing science, you know, in the future, I think this is a great way for them to be exposed. And um, I didn't know that there were so many different types of uh, projects out there, and uh, and I'm helping to spread the word and showing that showing my students what it's all about. Awesome, thanks, Cheryl. Um, there doesn't seem to be any more questions that I've collected, and I'm looking at the chat box, and oh, there is another question. And this question asks: um, Was this particular project and app too easy for high school high school students, or just right? Well, I think uh, I think it was just fine for high school students. It you know it's just collecting the data. It's just um, you know saying what type of trash it was and then putting it in the particular category. Um, I know the the video that I used with um, the woman that was the teacher showing the students. I think she was a middle school, but I I don't think it. I think any type of student can do it because you want to make them have the connection about where this trash can eventually end up. And that's the most important thing that I feel. Okay, awesome. Thanks, Cheryl. Um, doesn't look like there's any more questions in the chat box. So I'm going to hand it over to Pete to talk about his um, citizen science project experience. So if you can just pass the ball, Cheryl, from yourself to Pete, that would be perfect. I just went ahead and did it. <laughs> oh, perfect. Okay, thanks, I have the ball. Okay, hi, uh, my name is Pete, and I'm an AP biology teacher in Oregon. Oh. 
And I'm trying to oh. forward the slide. Yeah, so um, the slide arrows are up near the very top. There okay, right I'm now. sorry. I just, <laughs> I just caught that. Sorry about that. No worries, no worries. Okay, so um, I did the soil catchers with my AP biology class. Um, we chose that um, because we have uh, 19 students in the class. Again, it's AP biology, and we have a group of, um, they're all 11th and 12th graders. And I put it out on the class um, why we would be interested in studying this. And it had to fit our classroom culture. Um, it had to have uh, a project that was accessible to us uh, without really going too far out of the out of our way, um, as well as relevant to AP biology um, because our students are quite busy studying for the AP exam. Of course, it had to be cheap um, that we don't have to uh, buy any supplemental equipment that we don't have. Um, time efficient. Um, we have one-to-one -one Chromebooks at our school, so a uh, project that was internet-based would be um, very good for us to use. And also as a teacher, um, I thought it would be good because our upcoming um, unit in biology was physiology and anatomy. So that's why we chose stall catchers. Um, and it was the students that chose it, um, not really myself. Um, so what is this project? Well, um, Darlene explained it before quite well. Um, students look at different short video clips of mouse brains and they look for blood flow blockages in these little video clips. When they can identify one, they click on it and if they're correct, uh, they'll get a message that they're correct and if they're um, incorrect, uh, they'll get the same message. And this um, project is used for Alzheimer's research. And uh, that really resonated with all my students, myself as well, because uh, we're all affected by this particular disease. And our students at this age are understanding the biology behind the disease, so it's very relevant for us. It's also video game based, which uh, they all seem to be familiar with, uh, not so much myself, but um, they particularly enjoy that type of interaction. So here's what the video screen looks like. Um, it's like a video game, which has uh, a score card. Uh, they could play as a team or as individuals, where they could keep track of their individual scores and team scores. There's also a little chat window, so they could um, chat back and forth, although my kids were in the same room doing it, so they could speak out loud, but if they're not, they could chat on the little chat window and uh, check their points um, and their progress as they did this. Uh, some of the student comments were, as our um, post-activity discussion. They said it was very easy to learn, uh, but very difficult to master, uh, meaning they understood how it worked, but they weren't 100% accurate um, even after uh, a couple of minutes of playing it. Uh, it was very intuitive. Um, they enjoyed chatting um, as they were doing this activity. Um, they could gauge their progress and um, it took a break from taking notes and uh, studying biology for uh, for a little bit, which they enjoyed. Uh, so, what's the potential for for other schools, libraries um, to do this? Well, any age could really do this. You don't really have to understand a lot about the disease of Alzheimer's. Um, any age group can do this, and um, as was mentioned before, even people with Alzheimer's uh, can, can do this. Um, and it could also benefit your local communities um, by education um, of this disease and how scientists would um, go about learning how to um, solve some of these problems. And it also uh, gives the students a feeling of being able to contribute towards science, uh, which is very rewarding in itself. 
Um, and this could also be done globally um, in any different language or any different school. So it's, it's quite a good activity to use. And that's all I would have to say about this. Uh, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to ask them, answer them. <clears throat> yes, it's that time. It's question time. And there doesn't seem to be any questions asked during your presentation, Pete. I'm just going to have a look at the, uh, the chat box to see if there's any questions for you. And it doesn't look like there are any questions. I'll give it about 10 seconds to see if maybe somebody will pipe up and ask a question. Nope, there doesn't seem to be any questions for you, Pete. Thank you. Oh, there is one question. And the um, question came privately to me. Um, some someone asks, uh, were there any? Um, sorry, it keeps moving up. Any challenges to doing these programs? That's a pretty broad question, but um, that might maybe it's for everyone. Yeah, I'll I'll be happy to say um, one of the challenges. Um, well, for one, you have to have computer access, which nowadays doesn't seem to be a challenge, but um, uh, being very accurate with this was kind of challenging as a um, as a um, as a way to uh, identify these different blockages in the stall catcher. Uh, wasn't very easy to do, but once the more you do it, uh, the more accurate you are. That was the only uh, obstacle that I saw that the students had. Other than that, it was um, there was no obstacle. For, okay, awesome. Thanks, Pete. Um, uh, for the Marine Debris Tracker app, um, other than if they didn't have a phone, um, then what I did since I created the lab with it, I just had them record the data on, um, you know, on paper and then send it to me. Um, we wouldn't get the coordinates, uh, but at least we would have data to add to, you know, the, the, the app itself. At least I could add it. So. So I just wanted to mention there's one more question that came privately to me that I just noticed. It was earlier on in the presentation, so I'm not sure who it was directed towards, but it was, um, do you have any suggestions on how to keep the momentum going after Citizen Science Month ends? Yes, and this is this is Darlene. I'll just chime in. If you can you hear me, okay? Yeah, I can okay. hear you loud and clear. Okay, excellent. Um, so. You know, with, with SciStarter and the projects on SciStarter, those are ongoing projects. They, they kind of never go away. And for those that we lose because they're, you know, the, the, the research is finished, which is awesome, um, they collected all the data they need to, there's always one, a new one right behind it. So you can always keep the momentum going because there's always new projects coming out or sustain engagement in existing projects that way too. And I'm sure I'm forgetting something about something else big happening <laughs> this summer. Uh, but uh, and in addition to us helping to you know co-moderate or just support any kind of online event that you might be interested in, um, that's another way to keep momentum going. We want to we definitely want to build on that. Okay, awesome. Thanks, Darlene. Um, there's a lot more questions in the chat box. I'm just going to go back to the earliest one. Um, one question that I think is can be posed to either Pete or Cheryl. Um, were any students at either high school thinking that this real science experiment would lead to a career? Would lead to a career, that's, that's very interesting. Um, and yes, a lot of the students with the stall catcher um, was asking me a lot of medical questions about this um, and how they were using the research and um, what was the point of identifying these things um, with these blockages in Alzheimer's? And it was um, a good teachable moment um, to discuss, um, you know, the biology of the disease and um, and how scientists do approach these problems and how a lot of the approaches to Alzheimer's disease have been unproductive and unsuccessful. So, um, yeah, a lot of my students are planning careers and. Um, in biology, and that's one of the reasons why we chose this particular uh, science starter project. 
Uh, with the marine debris tracker, uh, I actually have not asked them about uh, if it would lead to a career or not. Um, that's a great question that I will totally pose to them. Um, I think it's a great way to connect, uh, to make real world connections between, you know, everyday people and what they're doing and to make connections with the scientists and with also like the the oceans themselves and how our trash that you know we may find on the side of the road can end up there somehow so i think it's the most important for them to be making the connections and if it leads to them to have a career in this then i will be super excited and happy awesome thank you for the answers pete and cheryl um, there's another question that I believe is is pointed towards Pete. Um, this question asks, did you use a Teams function for stall catchers? Well, we didn't actually uh, create or generate a team as we did it. Um, I wasn't too familiar with uh, how the platform worked. Um, although the students were talking and chatting with each other as we did it, and if I could do it again, um, yes, I would use the team function and um, either divide my class into teams um, or have our class as one team um, and compare our results with with other teams. That's that's a great uh, that's a great useful part of that uh, of that project that awesome. I did not capitalize on. <laughs> Awesome, thanks, Pete. And there's another question about stall catchers. Um, this person asks, can stall catchers be done with a team that does not have English ability? I wonder if that's what he meant by international teams competing. Uh, that yeah. could be a question for both you and Darlene, I guess, Pete. Yeah, okay, so, so yes, absolutely. You just have to identify these different um, areas um, of the video screen and click on them and um, I guess as long as you understand the instructions which are which are quite simple um, to figure out um, then uh, no you do not need any any English abilities to to understand this and it could be definitely done from anywhere uh, in the world in any in any classroom or on any any phone Awesome. Do you have anything to add, Darlene? I just want to say my co-panelists have done such an outstanding job. I, you know, I talk about this. I'm a one-trick pony. <laughs> but the fact you were able to to learn about these projects and speak so clearly about them, so passionately about the field of citizen science, is so impressive to me. I would like to add one more thing um, about the question of whether or not this may lead to a career in STEM. I think for me, I don't have a formal science degree. Um, and partly because I, as a kid, and all through college, tuned out of anything related to STEM because I knew I was not going to be a scientist. The beauty of citizen science is that it enables us to um, introduce everybody and anybody back to have a connection with science without feeling pressure to someday need to become a scientist. Anybody. Citizen science does not discriminate at all. You don't need to have a degree in anything. You don't need to have finished high school or, or college and so forth. So I think it has real power in just letting people know that um, you're always needed for science. You can play a small role. You can play a big role. But that science cannot get done without you. And that's the question. You don't have to become a scientist. If you do, that's awesome. But these are just great ways to re-engage with science. Awesome. Thank you, um, Darlene. Um, it's getting close to there. I think we have one more. We have time for like one more question, and this question is a question that I think is open to Cheryl and Pete. Um, this question asks: Are scientists on projects generally open to responding to kids' questions? I would say it depends on the platform and the project. Um, you might want to look at SciStarter.org forward slash education, and you'll see grade specific. We, speci we created that project um, because of all the, the parents and, and teachers, too, looking for resources that can be done from home for their, for their students and their families. 
And so you'll see great specific projects there. Some of the younger ones are designed very well to build in that type of feedback. Um, and the other ones are more, I, I see that happening more where the scientist hops on board and is there to actually answer questions when we uh, design for that through you know, online events. So this whole month, many of the events that have been going on um, did involve the scientists who run the project. And so that's a neat thing to think about as a librarian if you would like to do some of those online events that we, that we talked about. Um, it shouldn't be a lot of extra work on your part, and we can um, try at least to link in the scientists who are running some of these projects. They've been outstanding when we've invited them this past month. Okay, awesome. Thanks, Darlene. So it's now two, it's one minute past two o'clock. I know other people have commitments and other maybe meetings or if you're on Eastern time, could be the end of your day. I just wanted to let you know that Maddie Romancic has put the evaluation link in the chat box for you to claim your MLA CE credit. So have a look at the chat box. And I also wanted to take this opportunity to thank you all for your questions and participation in this webinar. A special thanks goes to our citizen science guest speakers, Darlene Cavalier, Cheryl Rice, and Peak Rexick for an excellent presentation. The NNLM PNR is committed to citizen science, so please stay tuned in the near future for more citizen science activities, webinars, or events. The next webinar in our uh, uh, PNR Rendezvous webinar series will be on June 17th on Emerging Zoonotic Diseases, presented by Washington State University's very own Suzanne Fricke. So uh, you have some, if you have some time, um, I, I'm not too sure what, what the schedule is like for Darlene, Cheryl, and Pete, but um, there are some outstanding questions um, that are in the chat box that um, hopefully you can address. Do you have some time, Darlene? There's one question pointed towards you. Um, I can. I don't see the chat box. Let's see. Maybe I'm looking at the wrong thing here. Yeah, I don't see the question in the chat box. But if you can read it to me, I'm happy to. I'm happy to answer it, and then I have to hop on another call. Okay, sure. There's two questions from one person. Um, the first question asks: Are historical research and transcription projects part of citizen science? Yes, they are. And in fact, there are platforms. Um, one popular one is called Zooniverse. Um, so projects from Zooniverse, if the project leader wants, they can add it to SciStarter. So we have several projects from Zooniverse that are on SciStarter. Um, so yes, that is considered citizen science and, and crowdsourcing. And then you can add a project to SciStarter. If you go to SciStarter.org in the top navigation bar, you'll see a link for projects and you'll see a link for events. Uh, events is where you would see a button that says add your event. And, you know, probably the easiest thing, if you don't already have a SciStarter account, you need to have an account to add a project and an event, is to go to the footer. So forget what I just said about the header. Go down to the footer and you'll see a link that says add a project. That's the easiest place to go to add a project. Okay, awesome. And the second question I think you already answered was, how can you suggest adding projects to SciStarter? Yes, and that's what I just walked through. Go to the footer on SciStarter.org and there's a link in there that says add a project. Okay, awesome. So that looks like that's all the questions in the chat box. Um, if there is any outstanding questions that any of the attendees have, um, you can reach out to any of the speakers today. The, their contact information is on the current slide. Um, but other than that, thank you um, for all of your time today. Thank you, everybody. And thanks, Cheryl and Pete. It was great to talk with you. Bye, Nancy. Thank you, everybody.